It is March 25th, 2005, and we're here in the studio with Dennis Dreeth, the composer, and Mark Goldblatt, the director of The Punisher. I'm Robin Estehammer, producer for Perseverance Records, and we're going to go into a little bit of more depth about the score and the music than what can be gleaned from the liner notes. So we're going to talk with Dennis and with Mark about the production of the music. And uh, let's start with you, Dennis. How did you actually get the job? Well, I was initially called by Bill House, who was the head of the music department for New World Pictures. I had never met Mark before that, and uh, Bill actually wanted me to be involved in some things. So having never worked with Mark, uh, Bill got me some copies of the of the work print of the picture, and we actually scored a couple of scenes that we actually presented to Mark, and uh, that's how we started. Yeah. It, uh, it was a very, you know, good collaboration, actually. And I remember the uh, the director from the studio at that time, they, they were very... The, the big thing was they wanted a theme. They wanted a Punisher theme. They wanted, you know, just a... Uh, a, a small, how can I say it, a short theme, a signature motif that would then uh, be integrated throughout various other cues in the picture, something that would identify the Punisher. And uh, so that's what Dennis came up with initially, I believe, was uh, uh, some prototypes or a prototype of, of the Punisher theme that worked pretty well. It was. I think the uh, the goal was to see how few notes we could identify the Punisher in was was the uh, the assignment. Yeah, it was it was minimalist because uh, yeah. the Punisher, of course, is a very uh, sparse concept, uh, a minimalist kind of concept in a way. Not a guy with a lot of emotion, the Punisher. No, not really. Uh, actually, my next question was going to be: uh, Was there any planned uh, way to demonstrate the Punisher's kind of sparse? Uh, character. Yeah, I think there was clearly, we talked about a lot of those kind of things, what what the character was about. Uh, obviously, it was a guy who was sort of um, heroic in a way, but also crazy. So we wanted to have this sort of heroic and grand score that was heroic, but it was sort of had a twisted nature because of you know his family life, the whole idea. And it's a comic book. So we had all those elements that we wanted to, to bring into it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, plus, uh, you know, Frank Castle, although, uh, because Frank Castle was the guy, he was the uh, police uh, officer who uh, was supposedly killed, who actually reemerged as the Punisher after his family was killed and went on a vendetta to, to kill uh, the entire uh, mafia, basically, in his city. And uh, so what you get is a kind of a resonance, I think, in the theme that harkens back to the duality of his persona, in fact, the, the, the person he used to be, Frank Castle, as well as the Punisher, who was more of a one-dimensional uh, vigilante. Uh, Frank Castle was a family man. He was a dedicated police officer. He had a sense of morals. He, he had emotions, 
whereas the Punisher has none. So there is, I always felt in the theme, and it's one of the things I really like about it, there's also a sense of, of melancholy behind it. You, you actually sense the guy he was, the ghost that he, he, he carries with him of, of, of this other person who was a human being, whereas he's not. I mean, not essentially. He's, he's almost supernatural. He's not really supernatural. He's like a walking dead man. Yes, I see that. At least in um, our interpretation. I mean, yes. that was the interpretation. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can interpret this character. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and uh, him being a comic character, a comic book character, uh, 1989 also saw the release of a very big... Um, Batman. Batman, yes. A very big uh, competitor of the Punisher. Uh, did you feel that pressure when uh, you were shooting the Punisher? Was no, there any competition uh, no, and the going reason on? is we were actually shooting... I'm trying to remember, we actually have a reference to Batman in the movie, in which uh, the Punisher is, has been caught by Lady Tanaka, and they're torturing him to get information. He's kind of on a rack, and his body is being pulled. And Lady Tanaka says, who sent you? And there's a pause, and he looks at her, and he says, Batman. <laughs> now, I have to say, at that point, Batman was either still being filmed, uh -huh. and that's all we knew. All I knew was that they were shooting Batman in London, and I know it was a Warner Brothers picture, But that's all we knew. We didn't know what it would be like in any way. I think the controversy at that point was that Michael Keaton was playing the part. So a lot of people said, Michael Keaton, that doesn't compute. So they got pissed off you know, yeah. uh, for no reason because he actually worked very well in the movie. But I always think that the Punisher is like really a guy who's in great pain. Mm -hmm. But he suppresses the pain, represses the pain very deeply. So on the surface, it's like he has this I don't give a shit attitude. I'm just going to kill the guilty people. I will punish the guilty And, and, and I don't care. I don't care about anything. But the fact is, and it's, it's actually revealed in a scene where he has a nightmare, where he's locked up in prison after the police catch him. And uh, he has a nightmare about his family, his kids and his wife, and he relives the experience of them dying. You know, his wife is trapped in a, uh, with the kids in a car that has a car bomb, and he can't get her out. It was meant for him, all the guilt that he feels. And uh, he wakes up screaming, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first emotion that we ever see from the guy because, you know, he claims to have none, but in fact, he's just yeah, very, he's very stoic. Yeah. So, but, and, and musically, uh, that's a very cool moment too, because, uh, I, 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 as I recall, you know, we have a lot of quick cuts, uh, of images from his past into inter intercut with images of himself as the Punisher later. And, and it's kind of building, building a very staccato, very staccato, very staccato. And then, wah, he, he, uh, big flash, the explosion, and he bolts out of bed. And the music uh, kind of t reiterates the theme, the Punisher theme, but kind of becomes very staccato and even discordant at times and kind of reaches an orgasm, <laughs> in a way, uh, on, on him waking up. Very, very cool little cue. Right. The idea from that was we had all these different elements of it. The theme kind of rang through that, but at the same time, all the little action pieces from his other activities are all interspersed with that, you know, kind of it, like as Mark said, staccato images that sort of um, play off the cuts, but yet the theme runs all the way through it and it does all kind of come to this big culmination at that at that moment so that when the explosion hits, the, all those elements come crashing together musically as well as as visually. How did you spot the picture? Uh, we sat down and uh, went through it frame by frame. Very, it was the uh, spotting was actually a pretty traditional mm -hmm. spotting session. Nothing unique about it. We uh, did all the stuff that we normally do in a spotting. And I think that the interesting thing, unlike a lot of other things, is once we spotted it, I don't remember moving cues around a whole lot. No, no, we didn't. Uh, in other situations, I know they'd sit down with the picture, and often you're looking at it and you go like, oh, the start is like off by 12 frames. Mm -hmm. We need to move that. Right. Or like, uh, why are we hitting this instead of that? And I end up like moving things a great deal and kind of re-spotting re the picture. But I remember that this was uh, somewhat unique in that we spotted it. I don't think... Uh, anything moved it was uh it was really unique in that and mm -hmm. once we did it we yeah. i think we had pretty much we were in sync about what we wanted to do with the picture what things we thought were important to mm -hmm. hit um which things we thought shouldn't be on the nose you know shouldn't be direct hits which right. things we should um there were also a massive amount of sound effects so that uh, meant we had to be careful with you know when we were spotting that that we also were cognizant of what the sound effects were going to do and that the music could carve out holes for that exactly Mm -hmm. Yeah, taking that cue. Were there any other scenes that you were specifically told to score in a certain way, or um, that were very important to you scoring musically? 
Well, it was interesting. Um, Mark was was a great person to collaborate with on this. Um, one is, I think, because of his uh, experience as an editor, has a great sense of, of rhythm and time. So I think we spent more time talking about the pacing of scenes than we did so much sort of the emotion. I think he left a lot of the emotional decisions to me, but we talked a great deal about, you know, pacing, how the music should propel things, the timing of things. Um, and I also felt that from the very beginning, an awful lot of times uh, directors and even other editors don't necessarily really have a sense that there's a, a, a time, you know, a rhythm to the to the scenes. But these were all cut in such a way and, and even directed in such a way there was a tempo. Every scene seemed to have almost a tempo that was inherent. I, I could sit there and look at it and it would almost define to me the tempo that the music should be. So I think we spent a lot of time talking about how that how things could either uh, play with that or play against it. But we spent more time, I think, talking about uh, movement and, and tempo than anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mark, I, I, Mark, did you direct the movie in a way that was uh, musically intended? Well, I, I can't say on a conscious level, no. But I, I, I do, I, as Dennis says, you know, being an editor, uh, I do understand the concept of counterpoint, counterpoint of images, and therefore I would imagine counterpoint of themes or, you know, although I'm not a trained musician in any way, I can't play a note. I think I played accordion when I was five, but I couldn't <laughs> do it now. Uh, I do sing in the shower, though, and uh, karaoke if you get me drunk enough. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, but the thing is, editing is inherently a very musical thing. It's kind of a free form. Did you use a temp track? Mm, yeah, we did, but not the way... I, I, you know, I used the temp track only because you can't show a movie to a studio mm -hmm. or anybody if you don't have music in it. But the temp track, and I couldn't even tell you now what was in it, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you know, action cues and suspense cues might have been au courant at the time or that I thought were good... Probably a little Tangerine Dream. I don't know what was happening in '89, or maybe maybe that was beyond Tangerine Dream. But uh, but but I we weren't using it as a template for what Dennis was going to do. I mean, you know, today temp scores are a big deal. Very often, uh, filmmakers fall in love with their temp scores, uh, and and therefore want the composer to kind of emulate things, which I think is uh, inherently a mistake, because uh, you're kind of hedging your bets. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you hire a composer who you think can contribute something, and hopefully they'll contribute something fresh and new and better than you're going to come up with a temp. So you really shouldn't try to, you know, uh, hamstring them, if that's the right word, uh, with, a, with a temp track. Well, I think it's is interesting to note that uh, Mark never played me a temp track. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so I, I knew they had when we talked a little bit about some things, but I don't believe I ever heard uh, anything in a temp track at I think all. you're right. I think yeah. we, we decided not to uh, uh, do that. What we did uh, do a great deal is is I would work on cues. We were doing um, a lot of synthesizer mock-ups of the cues that the orchestra right. would do. And Mark would come over to the house, and I'd place things. And he'd say, oh, I like that. Can we do something more like this? Can we maybe make some adjustments here? So there was the, the collaboration between us like that, where things were as I was working on it. And sometimes I would be working on something, and I know he got you know a call sometimes late at night, early in the morning for me saying, and I'd even sometimes even play something over the phone. I'm thinking of this for this cue. And hold up the phone, and Mark would say, yeah, I like that. Maybe we can get together later. Or something like so. We did a lot of that, mm -hmm. where uh, which I actually enjoy doing, especially when you have somebody that you like being around, you can work with, who has good ideas. Um, it's a good opportunity. I think the thing I've always said, working with somebody like that, especially somebody who's maybe not quote a trained musician, who might ask you to do things that were slightly different that make me go in places that I wouldn't have normally gone to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes maybe it was not the most conventional place, but it would be something where can we do something uh, that has like a different kind of rhythmic feel here or can move the scene in a different way. So that would cause me to do something different. But in terms of like the temp track and all those things, I think the idea was they, Mark and other people involved, were looking for me to bring something of my own to it. So it was a very satisfying experience for me. You did your own orchestrations on this score. Was there a specific reason for not using an orchestrator? Do you uh, work with one usually? Uh, mostly it was budget. <laughs> we, yeah. we, had, we, had no, we had no money on this one, and uh, we wanted to put as much money into the orchestra and on the screen as possible. So, um, And I spent most of my career, like Mark had spent a great deal of his, his time being an editor, um, a great deal of my time has been spent before and after then being an orchestrator and conductor. So I felt in some ways... That was closer to it. I could probably um, 
do the orchestrations just more efficiently and quicker than I could by handing it over to somebody else. There's a number of terrific orchestrators, and I love working with an orchestrator when I'm the composer. In this case, it just seemed uh, that it was a natural extension of it. And mm -hmm. frankly, um, it was, in this case, a budgetary consideration. We wanted to do the most we could for the orchestra. So, Yeah, it was a tight budget. I don't. Mm -hmm. know, I can't tell you what it was, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was tight. So, and I, I do remember, though. You know, as usual. But I mean, at, at the recording sessions, you have to uh, be cognizant of the time because you do have a limited amount of, of time with the orchestra. So you. So it's a good thing in L.A. Of course, the musicians are so great and so quick. Uh, quick studies, really. Uh, so it was, it was accomplishable. Very, very good. I think also a special mention should be made of the scoring mixer was uh, Bobby Fernandez and uh, a testament how well he does most of the mixes on the record, uh, at least the orchestral mixes, are all live mixes. Those were, uh, we didn't go back and do a lot of remixing. There was some remixing involved in a few cues here and there, but the preponderance of the cues are actually live mixes. Wow. So it was a live session, live mixes. It was, it was uh, real music in real time with real people. Wow. Yeah. Were you at the recording sessions? I don't know that I was. I actually, don't remember. I, the you were. Wasn't actually, I? No, I yeah. guess I wasn't. You I, were. I blacked things out. But it's, been, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a few years. Yes. So, yeah, actually, I, mean, I do remember some stuff. Was it Steve Bartok? Bartek? Did we have Bartok? No, we didn't have Steve. Uh, 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 doing per we had somebody adding percussion. There, there I was a remember. Steve Foreman. Was Steve a Foreman, okay. okay he was okay, a percussionist okay, okay. who did go. a lot of interesting sound effects. He actually created um, a lot of specific samples. We wanted some very percussive things. I we, remember that, yeah. We made a... One thing you may remember, we had we sampled a punching bag. Somebody actually hitting a punching bag. We turned that into a percussive sound that we used uh, as yes. like in some loops and things like that. So we tried to create some unique percussion sounds. Uh, so we did that, and then the we also had uh, captured those electronically and added those to the orchestra. So we would have the orchestra live, and we'd be triggering some of those percussion sounds. And I know Mark certainly was at all the orchestra dates. I remember that. Any anecdotes from the scoring sessions? Um, gee, I don't know. It was just like a, what I would consider a pretty uh, typical day in Hollywood uh, on the scoring stage, I think, is always a magical thing for me. Where uh, did you record it? I recorded it at, uh, at Warner Brothers, which ultimately became the Eastwood stage, mm -hmm. but it was uh, before that. Uh, we picked it. It's a great sounding room. Uh, the booth at the time, the electronics were kind of on their last legs, but certainly the room itself sounded great. The orchestra sounded great in there. Um, and the orchestra played terrific. One of the things about, you know, an orchestra in Los Angeles is there's almost not real anecdotes because what happens is you put the music in front of people. Yeah. They look at it, they perform it, and uh, the thing to do is not record them too many times. You get them in the second or third take, they, they sound as good as they're ever going to sound. It's you know, a pretty brilliant group of people. Mm -hmm. And then there were little things that it's interesting because what happens is you play, the, you work on the synthesizer mock ups, and as, as close as the orchestra you really get, it doesn't sound quite the same. Then mm -hmm. we put it music in front of the orchestra. Of course, the other thing that happens is um, people bring a little personality that wasn't there on your synthesizer mock ups. And sometimes you hear something that you really like somebody adds something um, that wasn't there in the synth and you want to actually can we play that up a little bit more can we get a little bit more of that personality in the score and then mm -hmm. you might make minor adjustments um, in the orchestration to maybe carve out a little bit of a hole for someone to shine through a little bit more um, those types of things so we did that but but basically when you do it the orchestra you know you'll rehearse it and then you start taking it, and, and you're right. I mean, you know, two or three takes, except in the most difficult music. Uh, when you're editing, do you think musically? You said you didn't. I, I do. I mean, sometimes, literally, I will uh, make up a theme as I'm watching a scene, not while I'm cutting it. I mean, I'm always thinking in terms of rhythm. So that's just an innate thing. It's like, you know, an example, I used to cut on moviolas. And if you know moviolas, mm -hmm. you yes. put a piece of film in, and it goes through, and then you can break it. Yeah. And then you using a foot pedal and some switches, you can go backwards and forwards. So you get a sense of timing that way. So, you know, it's like uh, Punisher's going to punch somebody. One, two. You know, and then you put the next cut on. So whatever it is. So you, 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 you get a kind of a musical rhythm going mm -hmm. and a visual. But I, I may make noises while I'm cutting. And then I'll look at the scene, and I may actually uh, add some music that I just improvise on the spot vocally. I don't know, whatever it is. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't compose, but 
prototypically, and it may be stealing from a uh, subconscious library that I've got of many different scores or whatever, mm-hmm. then I get satisfied that that's pretty cool. You know, and then, then I may put temp music on it just to show it to other people because mm-hmm. I can't be humming all the time. Yeah. It doesn't work too well. Okay. But, yes, mus- it, it is musical. But as I say, it's an innate kind of thing. I think, ironically, for me, one of the things I've always been fascinated with were film editors and, and the editing process. And I know I during the course of this, I, I just certainly picked Mark's brain a, a great deal. and always ask him questions about why did we make that cut there? How did you make that? I, it was something for as a composer. I always felt that um, there's such a – a synergy between the editing and the music, you know, because of the rhythm. Mm. So for me, it was a great opportunity to work with with, a, with an editor, even though Mark was directing this picture and not really the editor, but was certainly working with an editor I'd known and respected. So that was the fascinating part for me, and I certainly um, took the opportunity to ask him an awful lot of questions and uh, all the time about, you know, how do we edit this? Why do we edit it like that? So you worked a lot with Tim Wellborn, the editor of the film? No, not much at all. Actually, mm-hmm. I spent more of my time talking to Mark, but I was saying that I was interested in editing, so we we talked a lot about the editing process. Yeah, absolutely. But but uh, I'm glad you mentioned Tim because uh, Tim's a terrific editor, Australian uh, gentleman. Well, this mm-hmm. was actually a movie shot in Australia with an Australian crew, uh, and Tim uh, w- was one of the editors on uh, uh, The Road Warrior. But in this case, I think I kind of hogged the uh, relationship with Dennis here uh, because I could, <laughs> which is interesting uh, because as an editor, I'm on some movies, I'm very involved in working with the composer uh, in that not that the director isn't, but with the director and the composer. And I'll go to just like I used to go to Dennis's studio and, and listen to uh, temp, you know, or I should say first uh, pass uh, synthesized uh, versions of cues. Uh, I'll do that now. And then other directors just don't, they want to do it themselves. So mm-hmm. I don't do it. Now, the final question why did we have to wait 16 years for a soundtrack? Well, because you didn't have your company going uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> I think that's good a answer. perfect answer. That's a good answer. That's a... <laughs> well, I, I, I suspect one reason would be, uh, as, as I indicated before, uh, unfortunately, the timing for this picture was such that by the time the picture was done, the company that made it was folding. Or not folding, selling off their assets. They, mm-hmm. they sold everything. And the people they sold it to, A, were not interested in theatrical distribution. So uh, that's a problem. That's You've got a, a movie problem. and you're not going to yeah. release it theatrically. Now, what they did was they sold off what they had. Uh, unfortunately for us, they sold our picture to what was essentially a video company. And for various reasons, which I won't go into, they decided uh, that they weren't going to try to get an ancillary uh, theatrical distribution. They went mm-hmm. straight to video in this country. Now, internationally, the picture opened theatrically everywhere. And, uh, yes. you know, I even got some good, I should, we got some good reviews. Uh, and I kept them all, got a little scrapbook, you know, like in, <laughs> in England, for example, in France. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't help. So it doesn't help the visibility of the picture. No, it doesn't. That's true. And see, in those days, home video was... It just wasn't – it was emerging. It was happening. People had VHS players, although they hadn't saturated every home like they, like now the DVD players are. Uh, strangely enough, though, I will say that when The Punisher came out on, on video, this was unheard of as far as I could tell. We were like number five on sales and rentals for videos. Wow. A picture that had no theatrical identity. That's pretty amazing. That's really uh, And it, you know, stayed that way for a, a while. I mean, three, four weeks and before it dropped down a bit. So, uh, but, you know, again, e- even given that fact, the people weren't capitalizing on direct. No, see, today there's a whole industry, a whole huge industry uh, of pictures made for DVD, uh, DV, you know, or home video. They're not, they're not intended to go theatrical. And uh, that didn't exist then. So this was kind of an aberration. A video debut that was like popular. Nonetheless, the consciousness wasn't there, so it was, it was difficult. I would say. I would say, interestingly enough, though, um, the picture has had a life of its own of all these years. Um, uh, I periodically receive emails from people in other countries asking if they could get a soundtrack album with, with that. And uh, and Robin, you found me um, after many many years. So uh, so it did have a life of its own and and a fan base to this day. It's a very interesting project. And Absolutely. Well, all this and much more you can actually hear on the CD, which uh, by now you have in your hands. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you, Dennis. It's been thank a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> this is Robin Estahemo for Perseverance Records, signing off till the next interview. <laughs>